looks like students. It looks like students. Everyone's to you. Yeah, it's okay. You're great. Um, well, thanks for coming along. I, I wasn't sure about my priors in terms of uh, out of 800 students, how many would be interested in terms of booking a theatre. And I, I think I, I, I got it about right to get in terms of uh, not getting overrun, unless they're just getting lost trying to find the place. Okay. So, the way I'm going to run this is I've, I've got some questions that I've uh, sort of devised to try and uh, um, uh, bring out from our panellists uh, some uh, basic information, but I've also got some questions that some of, some of you have written for us as well that I'll, I hope to get to as well. Uh, so we, and we'll play it a little bit by ear. So I've got a bit of a script, but I'm uh, very happy to deviate from the script as the conversation takes us and uh, as your interests or questions and bamboos on them takes us. Okay, and we'll see how we go with that. It's a little bit clunky because in order to have this pick up the lecture capture, I'll have to hold this mic while I'm speaking and then I'm going to have to hand it to whoever's speaking here, so there's going to be a little bit of clunkiness. Um, but uh, bear, bear with us on that and hopefully we'll pick up for the students who want to be able to hear this uh, later. All right, so I'll just check that we're actually uh, recording and it does appear that we are, so uh, let's get going. All right, so I'd just like to say welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our panellists. Um, uh, representing the Bayesian side of the argument, I've got uh, Associate Professors uh, Amy Perthwaite and Charles Kemp. Okay, and they, their names may be familiar to you if you've done your reading yet, because they're two of the authors on the paper that I've given you. Okay, so we've got the actual horses' mouths here. Um, <laughs> not that they're very equine. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, and representing the connections side of the debate, although I don't know how you identify in terms of this fully signed, but he's been prepared to sort of play the devil's advocate on connectionism, and he certainly has some experience with connectionism, is Professor Simon Dennett. Uh, Dennis. And uh, Dan, not Dan, Daniel. Dan, Daniel, 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 we've got some <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> um, so welcome to all of you, and thanks for coming along. Um, okay, so I, I have sent the students, just to give you the background, I've sent the students the challenge of giving an oral presentation on this topic in week 12 of the semester. And as you can appreciate, this is not easy stuff to grapple with. I've set them quite a challenge. So uh, part of the, the idea of today was to, to, to try and see if we can talk about this at a level that we can try and you know, get a handle on what it means to think like a Bayesian or to think uh, from a connectionist perspective. The reason I've given you this uh, area to think about is because both Bayesian approaches to cognition and connectionist approaches are uh, what you might call broad frameworks for thinking about cognition. So they're actually, they're very important because they are, um, they're not just a little theory or a little model, they're actually providing us with a unifying framework for thinking about cognition generally, okay? And then all the little questions we can ask about particular processes and particular kinds of uh, models and implementations, they flow from these bigger frameworks. So. The reason that it's important to think about these two is because they are uh, prominent in guiding the way that we think about cognition and the kind of work that we do. And the stakes are kind of high because if we get it wrong and we pick the wrong side, if you like, we're kind of barking up the wrong tree. So we're going to we're going to see if it's perhaps not that black and white. I think you know by the time we get to the end of our discussion, I'd certainly like to be exploring the idea that both of these frameworks have something valuable to offer us. Um, but we'll, we'll see, uh, see where, we, where we get to with the, with the conversation. Okay, so what I'd like to do uh, to start with, and um, I'll, I'll pop this slide up. I've made some slides just to help uh, uh, if there's anything that our speakers want to, to sort of, uh, point to. But I, I'm starting off with the framework that I've given you from Ma, which is uh, his proposal that there are different ways of coming at the question of what is cognition and, and how, how do people think and learn and remember. Uh, and if you remember from the first lecture I had with you, we, we did pit these two approaches against each other and I, and I said to you that the, the Bayesians up here represented by Bayes' theorem are up at the computational level and then the connectionists are sitting somewhere in between algorithm and implementation. Okay? Uh, so we're, we're sitting, that's, that's the reason for giving you that to start with. I'm going to hand over to the panelists now though, so when I stop talking and I'm going to start off with a question for each side so generally speaking to this level of the discussion um, I'd like to start by asking you to each 
briefly explain why your particular position uh, or approach to cognition, why do you think that's the right way to think about cognition? What are these generally? Why do you think it's the right way? And, and what are the key features that distinguish it from the alternative in terms of this framework? Why, why is it one at one level and then the other at the other level? Am I, is it okay to hand over the equations for stuff? Yeah, so just convey what's speaking. So I'll start with... I'll start and Charles will jump in whenever I say anything wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, Amy Perforce, I suppose, representing the Bayesian side, although I feel like what I, what I first want to say is that um, I guess I don't see that as a strict dichotomy and that one is right and the other is wrong. Um, and in fact, these papers we wrote kind of out of a feeling of trying to accomplish for the field more or less what we're trying to do in this course, which is make it clearer what the strengths and weaknesses of each are and what kinds of explanations each offer. Um, you know, and the guise of each, each, each team puts forth its, its um, best explanation of itself and best case, I, we thought was the best way to do that. But I think most people in the field as well, correct me if I'm wrong, um, would also not think oh, any one thing is best. So that caveat. Um, the, the The real strengths, I think, of a Bayesian approach to cognition is what they allow you to do is that uh, these kinds of models allow you to address questions at the computational level. And what that means is they let you to answer, uh, better able answer questions like why and uh, how possibly. So say you, uh, you know, you're interested in, say, learning how kids um, or, or how people form categories. Um, well, the first question you need to ask is, what's the structure of the data in the world and what could a learner learn from this, right? And so in order to answer this what could question, Bayesian models allow you to do this really well because they have a very principled mathematical way of combining the person's or agent's prior ideas with a way of fitting what they see in the data to the environment to their different theories and then weighing those theories. That's all Bayes, Bayes' rule is. And so it really gives you a sense of what information the, or you know, what theories uh, the information in the environment supports. And then you can use that as a nice comparison to see what people do, right? And so it helps address us, uh, us to address the question of what are people trying to accomplish and how closely do they do this? You can make different choices about hypotheses or different choices about the theories in an effort to try to better match what people are trying to do. So that's an answer at the computational level of what kind of thing people might be trying to do um, when they're faced with a problem. It doesn't really say how the brain is actually doing that, and that's a very interesting question. But for me, the very appealing and very interesting questions are about why. Why are, uh, you know, what are our brains trying to accomplish? And when we fall short, why? Which you can only really start to answer in, until you can characterize how we fall short. Um, so Charles, do you want to add to that? I just have one brief point to make about the diagram that we have here. So First of all, I think most people in the field would agree that we want explanations at all levels. Second, I want to make sure it's clear that uh, Bayesian models often are placed at the top level, but there are other things in that top level as well. So the idea of looking for a functional explanation, trying to explain some aspect of cognition in terms of a good solution to a problem that the world poses, you can uh, develop theories like that without relying on Bayes. So David Ma, I think you talked about Ma's levels, he was very much associated with that top level there. I don't know any Bayesian models that he developed, but he did develop many other uh, functional, functional kinds of models. So at least for me, some of my work is Bayesian, some is not, but most of it uh, takes, is located at this top level and tries to characterize the functions that, uh, functions that cognition serves, different, different parts of cognition.
Okay, so I might start with the rebuttal, if that's okay. So, um, so, uh, so it's often, the distinction's often characterized in terms of uh, Mars levels. Um, and there's, there's certainly a, a difference in levels that um, there is between the kind of Bayesian approach and the, and the, cognitive, uh, the connectionist approach. Um, but I'm not sure that it really aligns as closely with this, um, this kind of hierarchy as, as it might first appear. And um, one of the things that uh, I would contend is that um, you can tell that a lot of the Bayesian uh, work is actually more um, at the algorithmic level than it is at the computational level. Um, and the way you can tell that is that it tends to uh, be focused on, um, on data that comes from people. So, um, so what's the alternative? Well, the alternative would be to actually characterize the nature of the, the cognitive environment in which um, people exist and to talk about um, what kinds of goals might be generated by, um, by that cognitive environment. And, and there are Um, there are such approaches, so um, most notably John Anderson's um, notion of rational analysis. And, and there the approach is you go out to the environment and you say, okay, how does information exist in the environment? And you talk about what would it mean to optimise to that environment. Um, whereas most of the work that you'll see in, um, by Bayesians or connectionists um, in psychology, for instance, will be focused more on what happens in experimental um, paradigms and trying to match um, people's uh, behavioural um, uh, characteristics, which where the goals are actually driven more by um, the instructions that people are given in that particular experimental situation, as opposed to um, what the, the cognitive environment in general is actually um, providing. So. Um, so I, I actually think, and, and uh, I guess the other thing that kind of tells you that um, that they have to be at some, in some sense, um, on comparable levels, is the fact that you actually do see contention um, between Bayesian models and connectionist models. So if they were truly at different levels of of analysis, um, then they would they would simply be um, describing different things, and there would be no uh, basis for there to be a, a debate. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to say that uh, that they t that both connectionist models and Bayesian models are primarily operating at the algorithmic level, um, and uh, and I say that because from the from the bottom up that even though connectionist models um, uh, have some kind of aspirations to be um, neural like in in uh, in properties, um, for the most part. That those kinds of constraints are taken, um, you know, not extremely seriously, um, and so I think for the most part they're actually operating um, at the algorithmic level as well. Um, why I believe the connectionist models are are um, a good way to go. Um, I guess a couple of points. One, one I think what we've seen over so the last decade in particular is just when it has come particularly to bottom-up kinds of processes, um, the connectionist models have tended to perform very well. So, so your, your home speakers, and, like your um, Google Homes and um, that do speech recognition, the mechanisms that are doing um, image analysis, uh, all tend to be based on connectionist um, models. And, and in fact, what, what I would argue we've seen over the last decade is this kind of process by which the connectionist models have have tended to eat the Bayesians' lunch. So, um, <laughs> so, the, uh, so things like speech recognition, which um, which did tend to be in the past, of, um, their focus has been on uh, has been on the um, probabilistic models. That's now pretty much switched and is primarily um, connectionist models. So I'll have some other things to say, but I should. Uh, So, 
I think Simon raises a, good, a few good points, but, but they take way more data than people do in general in order to make the same inference. So the question is, and the Bayesian models don't have that, right? Um, so the question is basically why? What's the difference there? And can we, and, and I, you know, can we approach this by trying to understand more exactly of what the human brain is trying to achieve? Um, yeah, I think that's it's a good place to start, and we're going to come back. We're going to come back to that uh, distinction between the way the two approaches of think about learning. Uh, I'm going to give I'm going to give the Bayesian this. Um, like what the? Okay. <laughs> My question is what the? <laughs> let's uh, let's have a look at this. So if if if. Uh, if all right. The question is like this, what, what does it mean to calculate a posterior probability, what are my desires, what are the and what is that? All right, so yes, okay. That there is Bayes' rule. So basically, um, the, the, idea, um, the idea of the sort of Bayesian approach is that we can characterize cognition, or you know, we hope to characterize aspects of cognition, by understanding better how people combine their prior knowledge, and that is reflected in this. That is, their prior, their prior knowledge, I'll go into what this H means in a second, and combine it with some understanding of how the world fits with their prior knowledge. That's what this likelihood is. Um, and then come up with some sort of conclusion. So what's, what's the H? H represents different hypotheses about the world. And H is different depending on whatever sort of situation you're in. So say, for instance, the situation you're in is, um, yeah, I'm trying to sort of learn a word. Um, and so I've learned this word dax, but I have to figure out which of four items it refers to, right? So my hypotheses might be, it refers to item one, it refers to item two, it refers to item three, or it refers to item four. Those are four hypotheses, but I could also have hypotheses that are like, it refers to all the items, or it refers to one and two, or two and three, right? So you can imagine all the sort of hypotheses that describe this situation. Now I might have priors about this, you probably have priors that most words refer to one kind of thing. Um, uh, um, and so you want to have some knowledge about what priors are coming into the situation with. But we also want to know how they combine that with data. In this case, data would be someone saying, hey, item one is called a DAX, right? So now what we have is we can predict for each of those hypotheses how likely the data was. about cockroaches. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? To me it's plausible that cockroaches are actually more Bayesian than people. And the reason for that is I think probably most of the things a cockroach does are things that have had the chance to be optimized, near optimized by evolution. Whereas people, we're put in an environment, we're faced with modern economies, we're faced with technology, we're faced with all kinds of things and natural selection wasn't preparing us to, to deal with. So I think there's a reasonable case to think cockroaches are more Bayesian than us. <laughs> Is that helping, uh, Marco? So um, the other question you had was uh, um, somewhat related, uh, and it was kind of about potentially turning the Bayesian models on up on their end and basically getting them to admit that at the end of the day, uh, because we're dealing with data coming in and having to, to deal with it, it, are these not essentially bottom-up models at the end of the day because we're having to look at you know, how the system gets, and it's getting to back to Simon's sort of complaints about the Bayesian approach, is how does the system get that knowledge in the first place? And, and if we have to start, do we have to start from the bottom up ultimately in order to, to evaluate these models? All right, I, I guess fundamentally, 
all models are building in assumptions. All, build in, all models, even connectionist models, are building in assumptions and implicit knowledge. Um, in connectionist mo models, it's in the structure, it's in how you assume learning occurs, it's in how the nodes are connected together, um, and in Bayesian models, it's in these hypothesis spaces. Um, so in that sense, you know, the, the real, only real difference is how explicit are the hypotheses and how much, um, uh, you know, in, in what, what form do they take. Um, in that sense, I guess I would say, I don't know, I feel like the computational algorithmic thing has been abused horribly <laughs> at this point. Um, uh, and I guess in the sense that I sort of think, you know, uh, and, and every model is and should be responsive to data, then in, in that sense, yes, I mean, but I wouldn't call that bottom up, I would call that responsive to data and characterizing learning. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, yeah, so I'm not sure I'm getting to the heart of the question there, but yeah. The data, so, yeah. I mean, I think if we go to... To Mars intent with the bottom up, he's, he's talking about starting with what we know about the brain, I suppose, and the structure of the brain. And that's that's the argument from connectionism that we start with simple processing units, a bit like neurons, and we don't build in too many assumptions, uh, and uh, and we see what we can learn from there, which is different to just talking about bottom up in the sense of data coming in and being used. Okay, so there's, there's I think the, the the way in which you're thinking about bottom up and, and top down there is a little different to the to the levels that, that we've been speaking of in my uh, account. Yeah. Um, you, um, we, we have this room a little longer. Anyone wants to stay, can I? But I'm very aware of my guest time as well. Is there any just last burning question that we might want to uh, to call? Yes. Simon, the way you've uh, thank you. the way you've explained uh, the connectionist models seems like it takes a lot of the uh, Bayesian principles and, and adds that, that to it. I guess I'm, I'm having trouble finding the line where, where they separate and I'm wondering if there's a spot where you feel the Bayesians are making a leap of faith that isn't justified. Is there something that they're doing that might, um, that might be too much of a stretch? So, so if you uh, don't make this distinction between content and structure-based hypotheses, um, and you're happy to uh, entertain any kind of hypothesis in the Bayesian space, then um, then I think what what you have what the real fundamental difference. I mean, it's true. I think that the connectionist enterprise is is kind of a subset of the Bayesian enterprise, right? But it's describe it in there. And, and to the extent that that's true, um, it's going to be uh, you know, difficult to come up with some kind of fundamental problem, right, because it's a subset. Um, I think what, what's really going on, if you think of the enterprise of, um, of how do we actually discover the truth of, you know, of how cognition works, um, what, what the um, connectionists are doing are uh, introducing actually more kind of inductive biases. So we're, we're saying there are, there are all these um, things that we're der deriving from the inspiration from the neural um, processes, which we want to say limits the space of hypothesis we're going to consider for how, um, how cognition works. Um, and to some extent, the uh, Bayesians are, are just saying that no, we're not going to be constrained by those um, by those um, kinds of inductive biases. So um, and so I think um, so it's a matter of, in some sense I think it's a matter of how you you think what's the efficient way to get to it to the answer um, and and uh, to a certain extent I think it all hinges on to what extent you really um, believe in the in. The, uh, the inductive biases that are built into the connections in the problems.
And when you say the inductive bias is the building, you mean the structure and the assumptions that the, there's something about the, the, the implementational structure that's important in constraining the way that we think about cognition. To the, extent, right. to the extent that these networks are neural-like, we have a very firm biological constraint uh, around the explanations that we give that Bayesians perhaps are, are, well, I could push this to an extreme and say, you know, there are uh, accounts of cognition where they say, well, the hardware doesn't matter, the implementation doesn't matter, it's the program and the functions that matter, and they could run on potentially different kinds of hardware on, on alien creatures with completely different circuitry to us. So maybe the implementation doesn't matter so much. Yeah? So A sort of unifying thing because I actually think if you look at the field as a whole I don't think the field should all be Bayesian or all connectionist by any means because what I think is that we each contribute different things and they're exactly how uh, Simon characterized it except that I'm a lot more optimistic about our ability to meet in the middle right so I think connectionist networks are quite valuable for understanding the inductive constraints caused by our biology or caused by different kinds of um, uh, setups I mean I think they don't. They aren't perfect mappings onto neurons, and and and, and, and that's like often that. glossed over. But you know, nevertheless, um, they're useful for understanding that. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of really interesting work where you use the sort of ideal, the Bayesian model as a starting point. And, and then you push down. And I think the starting point is important, um, but the push down is sort of, okay, people act like our Bayesian model in this way, but not in this way. Now, why? Is it because we have certain inductive biases that sort of are built in because we have fluffy, you know, fuzzy brains with neurons? Um, and to our Bayesian models, you can actually start to push down from the Bayesian end as well by, instead of assuming that the um, calculations are optimal, you can do, there's a lot of literature in the Bayesian um, uh, area about sort of changing the sort of algorithms used for calculation and the way different algorithms might map onto different kinds of implementations in the brain. So like particle filters or MCMC, I'm not going to go into all of those, but there are ways of basically looking at how the brain might be achieving these kind of computations. And they're very smart people doing work trying to sort of map uh, the kinds of things that you do in MCMC, say, with the types of computations that the brain does. And so I think that's where we can meet, and that's where really interesting ground happens. But to have that, you need to have both ends, the Bayesians to sort of say, well, what's the point anyways, and what are we trying to do anyways, and the connection is to have a bit more of a sense. So and I think that is a nice place to end. There is a nice quote in one of the papers that said, we're essentially building the bridge from, from different ends, okay? And uh, uh, the kinds of biological constraints that, that the connectionists offer are are informative and helpful in, in, in developing our thinking, but we, we need the functional explanations as well, okay? So, uh, but without wanting to presuppose the, the answer to your, your debates and what you come up with as <coughs> well, I think we can leave it there. Would you join me, please, in thanking uh, our speakers very much. <laughs> And Simon, um, I hope it's been uh, a little bit uh, more helpful for you. It, at the very least, uh, it, it shows you it is a complex space you're grappling in. My, my hope for you is that you engage with it to the best that you, ability that you can to try and work out where you sit on, on, on this question and, and what these models can tell you and why you think they're important. Okay? And I'll leave that over to you. There'll be more space on the discussion board for us to pick up some things as well. Okay, so thanks for coming.